Today I am joined uh, by none other than Kafefe Anon. He is um, a legendary poster, um, a guest who has been on this show previously. A very, very popular episode. Um, just, yeah, a legendary poster. Welcome. Welcome back, Kafefe. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be back. I was, um, I actually, I think almost immediately after the, uh, the, my first appearance on here, I made notes and I started taking, taking things. What should we talk about on the next appearance? What, what do we, and then, you know, I collected a little bit of reactions and I only got one really good one, but I got a good one. Oh, oh, and the, of course, the, uh, the spectator.au article about your, about your podcast, which I mean, I'm sure you get lost in just the, avalanche of media about your uh about your pod <laughs> no no i've i really don't i was all i was really surprised that uh i think it was just i think the guy was he seems like a very young guy the guy who wrote it and he really likes to know your enemy podcast so essentially he used the subversive podcast as a, as a vehicle to explain to his audience why the know your enemy podcast is much nicer and because it has a bigger reach i'm like yeah it's for shit lips yeah, <laughs> what no, do you think you know what but you know, I, I mean, all right, now maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I, I, I read his article as like, I am really intrigued by the ideas of the people on this podcast. And I think they're, I think they're fantastic, but I could not possibly explain them to the audience that's reading this piece. So I will make it seem as intriguing and forbidden as possible to draw people there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe the, the guy sent me a very friendly message afterwards and he said that he, he enjoys the podcast. So Maybe there was some like, you know, Straussian angle to this and, you know, people just being super esoteric. Maybe, you know, this this Zoomer kid is like playing 40 just to promote my podcast. So if that's the case, thank you so much, Angus. That's his name. Um, thank you for writing about it. And I mean, gen generally, thank you for writing about it. I mean, that's that's pretty cool. Um, someone, it was <laughs> even fun because sometimes I do like, not, not like a name search of the podcast and then just see what, you know, media references pop up and someone recommended it in kind of like um uh, in in the New York Times as a you know in kind of a fluffy uh lifestyle thing like you know what what things do you enjoy and someone someone working for the New York Times said oh you know you should check out this impressive podcast you know you need to pay for it but it's really good and I'm like what will the readers of the New York Times get from this? I wonder if anyone actually, you know, uh picked up on that actually went to to, to check it out after the New York Times recommended it. But um, yeah, that was interesting. Hey, I mean the 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 uh, the Curtis Yarvin, the Curtis Yarvin angle of uh, this is this is uh, this is our this is our audience for our thing, right? You know, the audience for our thing is people who read the New York Times because they want they want good coverage of things, and they, you know, not people who more naturally sort of fall on, or at least that's one angle of getting out our audience, you know, like our audience is the disaffected elites. Wow, this is just not going right. And the people who are sort of the, um, the natural leaders of the populist thing of the, we need a framework more than just this is what's sort of popular because there's no, because we don't control any institutions, right? So we have no institutional continuity from I mean, here, like an example of something that I was reading about, uh, or, or my, my favorite 20th century leader is, uh, is Mannerheim in Finland, right? And, you know, I mean, he, he manages to, you know, he holds off the Soviets and like Stalin ends up respecting him at the end. And what was his, what was his thing before that? Oh, and, and incidentally, he makes a, he makes a trip to the Far East as a, as a, as a czarist officer. And, and what is his training? He's got this German aristocratic background and he's, he's a, he's a, um, he's a, he's an officer for the czar. And, you know, but who do we have that's like that nowadays? You know, I mean, you know, we, we don't have, we've, we've, America has flattened the structures of the world in a lot of ways. So. Yeah, there, there really is no script for that caliber of man. Uh, I mean, you know, there's a lot of um, inspiration drawn from classical antiquity and uh, maybe kind of medieval folk tales and stuff in, in our circles, but like a a clear outline of what it would take to be um, heroic in, in any sort of, you know, it, it really doesn't work without a license for violence. I really do think yeah. that like the, like the total neutering of everything you know, trying to not be a nuisance to to people, um, it's it's really produced a world where where virtue is impossible in in a way, in in like that direction. 
Well, that's that's true. That is that is very true, and that's that sort of that sort of gets at my um, a, a thing I've been recently been hitting on on the timeline of of that a lot of things are the result of female cultural primacy, not necessarily women investigating everything, but just now that we've sexually integrated all of our institutions, now you have the institutions themselves make their decisions in a way that makes the women in them comfortable and so the women are not comfortable in male institutions men can adapt and be comfortable in female institutions but it, it kind you know i mean it, it kind of grates on men until you don't realize it anymore you know and then and then is is that the reason for the testosterone decrease in modern men is the fact that women walk around constantly nearly naked and, re and and you have to tamp down your reaction to that the reason for the testosterone decline in men i don't know something is but you know that's yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to um, look at that and, and interpret it as less than, you know, a call for white Sharia. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm probably not the first one to, to, to say that, but yeah, I mean, well, no, but okay. But this is, this is a perfect transition into, 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 into something I have prepared of a, of a yes, question please. that I had for, take it away. Okay. So, <laughs> So, so here is here is somebody that was his his account was called Himbo Sapiens at the time, and it's not it's something else now. But it's a uh, Yashapak on uh, Yashaf on the uh, on, yeah, on Twitter. Yeah, a rationalist adjacent guy, I think. Yeah. No? Okay. Right. I think so. Yeah. But he said he said, and and you can tell me if you agree with this or not. The overarching theme of Alex Ashuda's podcast is quote. Liberalism has destroyed the constraints that prevented defect, defect equilibria in in traditional societies. Is yeah. that, that was that's the first tweet. I and remember then it has a thread on it. Yeah, I remember that yeah. tweet thread, and I was about to respond to it, but then um, I didn't. But it's it's, I think not absolutely correct, but I think it's it's the theme in probably most most of the most of the directions that I pulled the discussion into because it is it is kind of what what fascinates me and what I've what drew me to this group of people in the first place, like just noticing the fact that it really, it seemed like we were circling the drain on a problem that no one even had the slightest, you know, lever to pull to, to even slow down. So yeah, I guess, you know, uh, Yashkaf is, is right. Or even see the problem. Yeah. 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 And, and then, all right. And then the final, and then the final quote that he had in the, in the, in the, in the thread, and I wrote this down, I, I, I copied this over and he said, I'm waiting for Alex to have a guest on that's willing to bite the bullet on anti-liberalism and say, quote, the trad world birthed liberalism, liberalism birthed chaos. So the only way out is to charge through the chaos, not a warping backpedal. And I just want to say that, that and then and end of quote. And I just want to say that I'm absolutely going to be the podcast guest that is going to say that you need to do that. Finally, <laughs> wonderful. Yes, I, yes, you've I been don't prophesied. Know if you were waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know if you've been waiting for that. And 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 I'm going to tie this into the uh, to the Spectator that AU article thing too, because there's there's mm -hmm. an interesting connection there. And and I'm going to say yes, we have to do that. And 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 on my Substack that has as of as of the recording of this, no essays yet, because my my brain has been retrained retrained to only write in 280 character bursts. Um, as I say on there, the only way out is through is part of the little motto of the of, of the Substack. And now tying this back to as the uh, the guy on your uh, as the as the spectator as the guy on the spectator.au was so shocked that we're all fans of Ted Kaczynski, which I don't think we're fans of Ted Kaczynski. But Ted Kaczynski opens his manifesto with the industrial revolution. As everybody knows, the industrial revolution, its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. But he's wrong because the only way out is through and there's no choice but to accept the industrial revolution there's no you you if you reject the industrial revolution you're like those that natives on that one little island where where they can you know shoot arrows at helicopters and and anybody in the world who wants to conquer them can conquer them so you know there's no there's the only way out is through the you have to accept you have to accept yeah. the industrial revolution yeah it's no, it's 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 interesting because I mean, in the in the last let's say six months, I've I've kind of slowly come to that conclusion as well. I was much more tied into the trad space, and you know, a little bit of return first time I was in on Twitter. That space kind of really made sense to me, and there is something to be said about the eternal. You know, the the future will have elements of the eternal just because they're inescapable because they're just emergent mm -hmm. out of 
the substrate out of nature, out of what we are. Um, but the idea that return is possible or even viable or even desirable is is hard and hard to believe. And I also believe that, you know, it really is all downstream from the incentives that we have now. And on in many directions, we are on rails. And what we make with the, the next stage of what, what comes next, what, what inevitably, inevitably comes next, that's kind of where um, the rubber meets the road. That's really where, you know, the, the theorists of the future will shine because, um, yeah, the idea that we're all just going to go, you know, homesteading and grow all our food and stuff like that. It's just, you know, it's just very jarring to me at this point. It just doesn't feel like. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it can't, it, one, it can't be the way forward, right? Because, you know, if you homestead and you grow your own food, you'll, you'll just get conquered by, you know, the side that produces drones. Yeah. You know? NRX I mean, is incompatible with homes, like total homesteading supremacy. Yeah. Well, you know, and then, and then we, we actually, you know, there, there was, there was sort of the clash on the timeline of the, of the NRX people and some of the homesteaders a little, a, a little while back. And it wasn't me, it wasn't a major thing, but like, some of them are just, they're not willing to accept that, you know, the only way out is through and the only way out is through. And some of them are, some of them and the ones that we were clashing with and the ones that, you know, who, who wants to talk about the petty stuff. Some of them are, are, um, they're sort of, they don't want to see the trend lines because it's still not that bad where they are. So, you know, like, well, my small town doesn't have this problem. And, okay, and great. Your small town doesn't have this problem, but you see that destroyed small town next to, you know, like, like a, a few, a few miles away, that problem, that, that place didn't have the problem until it did either. And the same forces are coming for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. I mean, the, you know, the very sobering thing that I've noticed is that this stuff is here. I mean, and, and by here, I mean, you know, um, <laughs> but fuck nowhere, Eastern Europe. And, and it's, it's really slowly eroding, um, a lot of the stuff that even here I, I took for granted growing up and, you know, I'm not saying this is some idyllic place before, you know, global homo, uh, destroyed it and stuff like that. We've had our own problems, obviously we didn't have these problems and these problems are a very kind of interesting, interesting mix. And they, they seem, like I said, they're on rails, you know, they're inescapable and yeah. they're, they're led by status seeking, you know, people really want to be in line with, with power. And it's pretty clear where, where the wind is blowing. Well, it's, 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 there's two ways that people want to be in line with power. One is you can, you can align yourself with the American machine and, and, and the American machine will, if, if you can get the attention of the, okay, and then going on, going off, going off notes, but I don't care. So if you can get the attention of the machine, the example that that I like to think of about this is Gamergate, right? And and I don't I'm not an expert in this. I don't know all the details of it. I, I did a cursory reading, you know, considering comparing it to how much I've read about other stuff, but I've read I've read, I know a little bit about it. And the little the 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 part that I know about it is what happens is you you have an incident and then someone in it is a bad actor. This woman is a bad actor for various reasons. But what she does is she presents as the progressive in the in this in this thing. And then because she presents as the progressive, she raises the flag and she gets the attention of like the small fish progressives in, in, in the press and the small fish progressives in the press see and flock to and defend her. And then it escalates and escalates because then the small fish get attacked by the Anons who are like, you're lying. This is not how things are going down. And then the small fish progressives raise the flag and it ends up in like the Washington Post and people end up speaking in front of the UN and like the whole escalation chain of the progressive machine gets revealed and the way they write all the stories is so incredibly dishonest just because, you know, but that's how the, that's how the press does. But it's dishonest in the specific way of everything that's important is we are the good guys, you are the not the good guys. And everyone on our side is everyone on our side is right. And then every action anybody else takes is wrong against us. And and it and it shows it 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 replicates constantly because they have they have the same pattern, they have the same power seeking. But the point is that's the 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 one way of doing it is you're raising the flag and trying to get trying to get you know somebody to to take up your cause. That's why you seek and that's why you can conform to American 
to Americanism and to the you know to the GA or or GNC is the uh more edgy phrasing of it, which I'm not going to say what that stands for on this very nice Thank family you. podcast. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but you know that 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 sort of ties in, and then the second way is that just by agreeing with the progressive ideology, you form the most you have the most powerful thing in the world, which is coordination. And coordination is the most powerful thing in the world, the most powerful thing there is. You know, weapons are nice. Weapons don't do a thing unless everybody agrees to fight, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and weapons, the, weapons lose to coordination. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just a, the, the interesting part of it and why a lot of people um, don't seem to see it. I mean, it's just beca- because it is invisible. It really kind of sinks into the background. Like if I if I confront someone with progressive views that, you know, have absorbed them through the internet here, they really don't see it. They don't even see them as their views. They really just see them as, you know, the basic operating system of the world. You know, this is absolute common sense. You know, it's, it also has to have this shine of, of expertise. Um, it's It really disappears in the background. That's why it's even harder to challenge. It's not like you can just sit down and, you know, we're going to, we're going to debate these ideas and the marketplace. I, I really think the marketplace of ideas might work within, I don't know, maybe some very specific autistic academic subdisciplines, but in in things that are considered the water you swim in, you can't even get a, a an angle like your lever will not. There is no no hooking point for for you to start you know tearing down these ideas. Like people will have to yeah. go through some sort of dark night of the soul. In a way, that's kind of what I went through. You know, I had to kind of see things in reality. You know, be autistic enough to, to, you know, go against my, my, you know, kernel of agreeableness to actually say, okay, this is fucked up. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, see, see what's, what's going on with this stuff. So yeah, it, it really is a, is a very hard thing to do. Like the, the, the deprogramming of the normies is, uh, is I feel like a, a doomed, uh, a doomed plan. Oh, it's doomed. It's doomed. I mean, you can't deprogram all the normies, but the normies are, are sensible. Can we can we put let's let's put a pin if you remind me and we can circle back on the marketplace of ideas because I actually I don't know if you you've seen my posting on that. I've actually posted pretty uh, like I have a, I have a, a a relatively developed idea about that. But oh, you, nice, you yeah. touched on something else. But you touched on something else that that is exactly in my in my notes for that I prepared for uh, that I decided I uh, things I things I kind of wanted to talk about and. It's it's that the progressives see their worldview as not a worldview. They see it as just the way the world is. And an extension of that is is something I'll just call like I'll, I'll temporarily call it the progressive passive voice. The progressive in a conflict is never takes an action. Things happen that that meet progressives will. And the non-progressive takes an action, and every action the non-progressive takes is to be condemned. Now, what the hell are you talking about? And I and I came up with just an example off the top of my head, and 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 again, you know, maybe controversial, but whatever, you know, it's it's the the, the Kyle Rittenhouse case, and every, but you know, everything is controversial because you know, and and, and, and I, this is a side note to the side note is everything that can demonstrate things is controversial because the reason why. Because it's not an accident that it's controversial. These are barriers that get put up in people's minds to prevent them from noticing how things work. So you can't point at a non-controversial thing that make things work. And that's sort of like how IQ was supposed to be like this slam dunk thing to get you into the rest of HBD, which is the other ways people in different groups differ in personality and temperament and and, in how they cooperate in the societies they build. But IQ is the slam dunk thing. Hey, you can give somebody a 10 question quiz and you can find out how well he's going to aim at a tank, aim the gun on a tank. Isn't that amazing? And and you can and this replicates in every single area in the, in in their entire life. That's the slam dunk thing, and that itself is controversial because progressives don't like the the consequences of that. So everything you're going to bring up is going to be is going to be controversial in some way. So here's my example, if you're ready. So Kyle Rittenhouse. 
the and and how they tell the story of what went on and 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 i don't know if everyone is aware of of the whole thing but it's it's there was in the area of kenosha there was a there's a guy jacob blake who was a black guy jacob blake who was killed by police right police were serving a warrant on him for you know some some of the usual nonsense that that gets gets up to in american cities with with blacks where you know i mean they 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 live lives that are built to be that way by progressives like but, domestic abuse or something it was something like that yeah it was a domestic abuse but but the point is it's just you know the police are there to to you know kind of keep like well you know i mean we need we need jacob blake to keep reproducing because we need more generations of jacob blake so then we have to sort out the lives of jacob blake and sort out his love life you know like sort out like what the women in jacob blake's life think about jacob blake has to become a thing that that the world has to get involved in which is ridiculous <laughs> but he goes and you know he reaches into his car or reaches into especially her car right you know i mean africa major major local female produced wealth but he reaches into her car and he grabs a knife right and he'd already been tasered twice by this point in the interaction with cops and they shoot him and kill him right now the framing of the whole situation is if think about the passive framing right if you're progressive you would never say the cops the cops you know he got shot as a result of him grabbing the knife the progressives always say the cops chose to shoot him right the framing is not passive on their part but the framing is passive later when there's rioting and kenosha burns down the rioting is not framed as a choice the rioting is framed as just the natural reaction that people have to this incident that was an injustice. Injustice causes rioting. No people have will involved anywhere in this, right? And then Kyle Rittenhouse appears because again, the rioters are the pat of the progressive good guys. And then Kyle Rittenhouse is there and he's defending a business that he worked, or I think somebody called for, for them and he like works in that city, but he lives like 20 minutes away and his mother lives there. And you know, he's a single kid of a single mother, something along those lines, not important about the details. So he's there and he's with a whole bunch of other guys. And there's a video of, of the people that he's with and the protesters come to him and then he takes the action of shooting people who were not taking actions in charging at him with guns and trying to kill him. That was just something that happened. They charged at him with guns, and that wasn't a thing that, that they chose to do. That was just something they had to do that. How could it not happen? Kyle Rittenhouse's existence was a, was a provocation to these people. So it's all, every bit of this in, in the macro and in the micro reflects the fact that the progressives have a framing where everyone on the progressive side is passive and everyone against the progressives is active right so yeah yeah no i mean it's here for reaction <laughs> no i i i agree and i think you know it's it's obviously a convenient framing but it's i think it's also downstream from the, the fact that you know the the way they see criminals uh criminality the way they see minorities as well like it, it doesn't paint a very pretty picture, um, you know, the, this this complete passivity, you know, just uh, I mean, it, it really is essentially the, the 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 final model there is is um, kind of a Skinner box type thing where, you know, this, these people are animals and, you know, the the yeah. elements around them, you know, the wind is blowing. So, of course, the dog will bite, um, you know, <laughs> that's that's, you know, it's not not very flattering if you really consider it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. But they're not, they're not even, they're not even consistent on that. If, if you, if you want to be that charitable to them, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not always in the mood to be, but if you want to be that charitable to them, they're not even consistent with that because it's like, it's like, it's like SBF, uh, Sam Baker Freed's mother, I believe, or his, his aunt has a piece and, and, and. Not in my notes, so I might get some details wrong. His aunt had a piece about Steve Saylor wrote about it on on the UNS review, and his aunt had a piece about uh, how criminals things that they do aren't their fault, and so therefore we should they have no choice but to do these things, and therefore we should move against move against the the idea of punishing them. Well, I don't know if that's the conclusion you should necessarily come up with. You know, maybe you should try to disincentivize them in ways that they would understand. And if that fails and there's nothing you can do to disincentivize violent crime, then, 
uh, by some people and they have no free will whatsoever, then the logical choice is what do you do with a mad dog? You know, what do you do with a man who can't live in society without constantly attacking people? Well, the traditional choice among every civilization that has ever existed in all of human history is you execute him and you put his head on a spike outside the city walls to warn people that that's not acceptable behavior. But somehow they don't come to that conclusion for some reason, even though that that's the logical implication of what they're saying. Yeah. I mean, the the, the fact that that's not even on the table, you know, if, if someone, you know, bring someone back, from, you know, from two 2,000 years ago, let's say, and they would kind of give them a few um, basic coordinates about our civilization and then tell them, you know, tell them that, you know, death penalty, we don't do that. I mean, from that single data, data point, they could, they could deduce quite a lot about the, the, the quality of, of the yeah. point that we've arrived to. I mean, this, you know, you, you have a forest with a lot of dead wood. I mean, I'm, I'm really, you know, forcing some metaphors into this, but it's just, you know, it, it cannot thrive. It cannot go anywhere. You know, if, if you're only, um, of uh, criterion of success for your civilization is the maximization of, of any wood in your forest, you know, that's going to turn into, <laughs> into a wasteland. And, um, yeah, I mean, take, take from that, whatever you, you will, but the fact that there are no limiting conditions yeah. on our civilization in that way is, is insane. It just doesn't work that way. You know, it's, you have no civilization. You have no way to enforce decivilizational processes. Well, you know what? This is a perfect transition to the to the to the to the next thing is is okay. So no one on their side is thinking about civilization. Everyone on their side is thinking about okay. So wait, I paused. Okay, so so there are three classical forms of government and of governance of everything. That Aristotle talks about you can have, you can have a, a, a monarch monarchical type government you can have an oligarchical type government where it's governed by a few people or you can have a, a democratic style where you vote on things to do right and in an oligarchic type government in an oligarchic type government it almost immediately breaks down in a very specific way and the very specific way that it breaks down is no one in an oligarchical government governance style has any incentive to worry about the actual whole of the system itself. No one worries about, hey, what exactly are we doing with our civilization for the eight for the 800 people that were on the Zoom call, you know, the, the post-election Zoom call. No one worries about what's going on with our civilization. Everyone on that call is, how do I make sure I'm one of the 800 people who get invited to the Zoom to the Zoom thing? So the result is the progressive system creates a, a self-reinforcing loop and no one inside the thing can move the move the progressive machine in any way shape or form because the name of someone who tries to move the progressive machine towards sanity is called a conservative because he abandons progressivism and conservatives are totally ineffectual because they're like i want progressivism up to the point where it got uncomfortable for me so no one can move progressivism towards towards sanity. So we have a, a civilization dedicated in your analogy to populating the woods with dead wood because the total biomass gets counted and gets power to the person who puts the most wood in the forest, right? So all the individual people are competing with the others and somebody who stops and says, no, this is a bad idea. We should stop loading this forest down with dead wood doesn't get them to stop. But he just gets to lose his position to the other people who want to put more and more dead wood in there. So we're yeah. we're on this course towards destruction. And there's no way of avoiding it. And there's no one within the system that can act against it. You know, and the, the idea of, and again, I'll, I'll pitch the, uh, the NRX idea of monarchy is basically that a king who is in charge of the system as a whole has an incentive to look over the value of the system as a whole, because if the system as a whole collapses, then he's responsible for that. And he can't just say, well, these are the rules. I have to operate within the rules like it's a game of some kind. I have to operate within the rules. And if I don't, someone else will, you know, and I'll get cut off, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then the thinking that, that this is done becomes the thinking at the elite level and People model their, th they only have one way of being able to think. Most people 
can't have two models of how the world works in their head at the same time. So this is the only one they have. So they kind of, so, so this idea and this way of viewing the world trickles down to everyone and everyone becomes a responsibility avoider in all areas, even when it's silly, except if you have very strange circumstances, like if you work for a company and the CEO is actually the boss in charge. So you're thinking, I would, I would like to hear what you, th- what you have to think. I can see you're very pensive. <laughs> No, I was I was just thinking about the um, the fact that you know we were talking at the start of the podcast about you know the the lack of a heroic map for people, but it it does feel like it's all kind of um, you know reduced through you know the the feminization that you were describing. We're, we're kind of led to this point that you know if if you can't exert any any power in in that other domain. It really doesn't. It doesn't seem surprising to me that you know that this is the only way. You know, the only way you relate to other people. You know, even even in work. You know, even even with a CEO. I mean, it's you know most organizations are, are permeated with this stuff. It really does feel like most um, organizations operate as oligarchies. Yeah, because the the employees sort of take. I mean, you know, you can see to Twitter is, is you know because right now we're recording this. The current drama is Elon Musk taking over Twitter, and you see that. Twitter itself was an oligarchy. It was sort of like these informal networks of control among the employees were really who was controlling the place when Jack was in charge. And then you've heard nothing about what Parag did when he was there and when he was in charge, because he wasn't even, I don't even think he even tried to pretend to be in charge. Like Jack at least had to be like distracted by, you know, like, like surfing and drugs and, and, and his, uh, his very cute mulatto mistress. You know, if you remember the picture of her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> very cute. Uh, I, I mean, to be honest, if you're a tech billionaire and your employees have taken over the ship, I mean, what are you gonna do? I, I can, I can. What else are you gonna do? It's not, it's not the yeah. the worst place. Well, to you be. can fight. You know, you can fight. You can fight for control, but it seems like the only one who's got the balls to fight for control is Elon. I mean, the, the, the founders of Google checked out a long, long time ago. Like Google is running itself at this point it, and in an oligarchic fashion. Absolutely. And I guarantee you that these same vo- same same forces are working inside all these companies about who gets to be the passive voice and whoever whoever can be framed in an in-office conflict as the one who took an action is the one who gets to be in the wrong. Why did you choose to do that? Well, we, you know, why did you choose to do that versus, well, this is how we do things in this blah, 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 blah. We didn't have a choice. And like everyone sort of like competes to be the passive voice. Yeah. And that's, you know, tells you a lot about organizational bloat as well. I mean, that's essentially all the incentives you you have when you, it's very hard to be fired from pretty much any job at the moment. Um, in, in most, yeah. especially like in a tech company, if, if you get in and you know, the, the, those interviews can be a little bit tricky for but once you get in the door it's almost impossible to fire you and then like you said you have the that essentially the incentive of of not you know sticking your head up and not doing really anything just you know going with the motion and you know saying that you're doing stuff at stand up and then sitting down and not doing shit for the rest of the day it's 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 quite easy yeah 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 well that's 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 it. And this is this is a sale. This is a sailor theme. And again, I, I recently watched him on your on your on your podcast, which is a great episode. I'll plug another episode while I'm on here. And um, but one of the things he talked about was our elite institutions seem to have compensated for how hard it is to for somebody to fall out by raising the barrier to entry. You know, it's like you can never be listened to if you didn't go to an elite university. So that that's sort of the compensating factor to the fact that you will be listened to forever no matter what stupid things you do in in your in your thing but i don't know i don't know you know that's that's him being i think a little bit more optimistic about it (laughs) i don't think the forces are necessarily them trying to steer towards an overall level of sanity i think it's just that sort of once you're in you can't get rid of someone for the good of the system as a whole you only get rid of someone if you want to make a move on them for power because it costs, you know, it, the analogy, of the, you know, the, the thing is everyone has a certain amount of limited political capital in, in, in an organization. You, you can get people to go along with you, but you owe favors to them, right? You know, 
who is going to pay off their favors to get rid of someone who's hurting the organization when you can use your favors instead to move yourself up in the organization or to secure more of the organization's loot you know so it's it's again it's a failure of oligarchy yeah you know it was really interesting um one of the companies that i worked for while i was in in uh, the uk was a um a, a very flat hierarchy organization essentially a company that was run for the benefit of the employees which you know can be a noble effort but the problem is you know if it doesn't you know if it doesn't prioritize economic outcomes then it's got it's got a serious problem in. So essentially, this was you know it was running a system called holacracy, um, and you know there are many good things to be said about you know the intentions of the founders, really nice kind of rationalist type people, you know very cuddle puddle sweethearts, all that you know only good things. But uh, the problem was that it was essentially um, extremely empowering for people with you know extreme personality disorders to actually take over the company. Because all it was, it was yep. all predicated on the fact that you know we um, you know once you get into the company there was a really st- kind of strict psychological interview to check if you're ready to be in in a, in a flat hierarchy type of company. Okay, let's say that's you know scientific, and then you get into the company, and then the idea is you set your own salary, you set the rules for the running of the company. There's extreme bureaucracy. Like I would say, maybe two or three hours of the day were spent just you know negotiating the fine details of how we're going to live together in, in the same office space or not because you could work from home indefinitely and and all sorts of things and then the, the problem was you know you had like someone essentially they hired sociopaths and then sociopaths would set like set themselves an insane salary everyone in the company would revolt they'd be like what the hell you know the normal people the normal people would slowly leave the company and then you you're left with a bunch of sociopaths you're left with a, <laughs> so, you're left with a metaphorical knife fight between sociopaths over power and how to divide it within the company yeah as just because you're a quokka the, and you want to have you know heaven on earth yeah but the, you know that's okay so now this this comes back to when i asked you to put a pin on the, the marketplace of ideas this comes back to the marketplace of ideas so so the example that i like to think of on this is wikipedia right Wikipedia was founded by quokka like libertarians who believed that editors would compete in the marketplace of ideas to have better edits, which fantastic. You know, if, if editors competed over truth, that would be great. Um, why? Why would they do that? When instead, what you can do is you can form a team of sociopaths, as you can call them, or you can just call them progressives. And you can form your team, and as long as you can coordinate with the other members of your team, you can promote each other, and you can log roll through all these things. And this is actually the classic thing of how communists take over, practically speaking, various organizations. They're masters of meetings. They're masters of of, of decentralized decision-making. Like you go to a meeting and nobody can, and, and, and then they make the meeting last X number of hours and everybody gives up except for them and everybody goes home and then you vote yourselves whatever you wanted to do. You put your one guy in charge of the treasury and you're perfectly, you're perfectly trustworthy and above board until it comes time. And then, you know, you can funnel funds to your people, but do it all in an above board way. Like it's very much progressivism is the ideology shaped to take over oligarchical systems and to do it so that it allows coordination of people and whenever you have a team you can win a conflict and the marketplace of ideas ultimately is a conflict because it's it's the win condition in the marketplace of ideas is the guy you're arguing with agrees you're right what if he just never agrees that you're right you know what if what if, I mean, and you can look at this with 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 IQ and with and and I think and it's funny because this is quote unquote controversial, but I think it's the most basic thing in the world. It's it's the most obvious fact in the world, and it replicates across different societies across the entire planet. There are billions of data points for this. It shows up everywhere you look, and they still have a brick wall on it and keep it from winning in the quote unquote marketplace of ideas. What does that tell you? It tells you that teams win conflicts. And if you can form a team and cooperate, if you can form a team and cooperate without overt communication, you can always win. 
you know, and then and they use this trick that it, they, they 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 actually this is fun because I I played with this once because I I I like to try to like sort through these things and then play with them and one of the things I sorted through was they use something I called the neutral observer trick. Have you have you read this about when I posted on this? No, okay. no, I haven't. So. Yeah, so they use they use what I call the neutral observer trick, which is or the neutral arbiter trick, which is well, somebody somebody on the progressive side, somebody openly on the progressive side will make a claim, and then somebody will make a counterclaim, and then somebody else will will come in and will be like, well, I'm just not convinced of this progressive counterclaim. How do you account for blah blah blah? And this is an extension of the sovereign sets the null hypothesis into the sovereign sets the null hypothesis and the burden of proof. And so the neutral arbiter will say, you know what, I'm just not convinced of, of that. So sorry, we have to stick with the null hypothesis that the progressive set in the first place. And I played with this and I, 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 I was amazed at the result. I just said, I went on a thread um, and it was about, and I don't even remember, and this is lost in the mists of time at this point, but I went on a thread and I just, I just decided to try to play with changing the null hypothesis and declaring myself the new the neutral arbiter and see what see what the person would do and on this thread i went and i said well i'm sorry but i'm not um, my 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 null hypothesis is that this is 100 percent genetic and zero percent environmental and you haven't proven to me that that's false and the person kept jumping through hoops to follow it and i kept saying nope sorry i'm not convinced of that i'm not convinced of this you have to show me the specific environmental things that would cause x y and z and he couldn't show me the specific environmental things and it was amazing to watch like it was reversed and he just naturally followed the script but it was backwards and it was like you could tell it was like, like why is this why am i doing this like anyway so that was Something I thought that's very interesting, and it works very powerfully as a tool for them, and they're not conscious of using it. And and it's and it's you know, yeah, yeah. It, you know, I know it's because they they're not conscious of using it because you know it's it's in the water. It's it really does come through every form of media. You know, it's just you know watching rainy days, watching Netflix shows, and essentially the only the only moral story in every one of these shows. And you know, this this goes back earlier than Netflix, obviously, is that normal people are wrong and the outcasts are good. Normal people are wrong yeah. and crooked and defective and psychotic and mentally ill. And everyone who looks crooked, psychotic and mentally ill is actually a, a nice sweetheart. And they're only, you know, they're, they're only stigmatized because the normal people hate hate their goodness and banish them to the to the <laughs> edges of the of the city. And it's just the story again and again. It really just, it's it's messed me up, man. I can't watch any more TV. I can't watch anything. It's just, it's, it's sickening. Yeah, um, because once you see it, yeah. Yeah, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Like once you see it, you're like, Oh, this is actually sending a message. This is this is this is intentional. The other thing that they do, and you'll you'll see this is how can you tell that the bad guy is the bad guy? And it's the bad guy doesn't follow oligarchical decision making the bad guy is dictatorial the bad guy is look i'm in charge here we're going to get it done and that's that's a, a sure tell that it's the bad guy when the most normal thing in the world is if you cannot walk into a situation or an institution and ask someone hey who's in charge here then you then the place doesn't work right and 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 you know curtis yarvin's thing is if you've watched a movie if you've eaten a meal at a restaurant or you've bought a car or driven in a car, it, every single one of those was was sort of directed by a CEO. And I'll take objection with the with the car one because I think the car companies are uh, large enough and existent enough that they're not really CEO. They're not as much CEO driven. But every single movie is a is a new project driven by a CEO, driven by a one by, driven by a king, and every single restaurant is driven by a king because that's the only way humans can get things done. Yeah, I except mean, under very special circumstances. Anyone who's been, you know, in primary school, high school, college, and had to do a team project—I mean, the fact that you you didn't realize this simple fact about human nature—any any group larger than one oh, is going to be a a hive of conflict and and status games and and power play. It's just the way it is. And the idea that oh, you will just scale this up to to the the order of millions, and that'll sort out the kinks. Um, just insane. <laughs> It's insane.
Yeah, but that's funny though because you know I never. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in my notes as an example of uh, an example slash uh, a way of thinking about this as as a place to hang it. Um, school projects as a group projects are sort of what are they really teaching you when you when you do a group project in a school? They're teaching you to and they and they and they tell you like don't let anybody tell you what to do, and now go and do a group project. So in other words, they're telling you, hey, sort of kind of learn how to manage the chaos involved in having an oligarchical decision type. And and they don't keep your team together for years and years and years, which would be the logical way to do it, which which means you could sort out a leader. They break your team up and you have a new team the next time. And so it's sort of like it's built to maximize how bad it looks to have a, a a monarchical a king be in charge of the group because every time your new group forms somebody has to fight over having a king and that's the downside of having a, of the monarchical version and the upside of the oligarchical is you can kind of muddle through without going through that conflict um but well it's actually more democratic if everybody in the group is but whatever that's it's leaving that aside but then you then you break the group up and you don't get to the idea is you pay the cost up front and then if your group stays together and you let's say you imagine you did group projects with the same group in four years of high school like how good do you think your group would be at doing projects at the end of the fourth year you'd be amazing at it you'd be you'd be you would have learned the lesson of how to have a group with hierarchy and people could learn how to specialize in things somebody could specialize in pre in presenting the things somebody could specialize in 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 sort of like how in doing doing research somebody could specialize in calculation somebody could specialize in all kinds of different things you could build a really effective team but instead of instead of that oh well we'll, we'll do a new group next week so yeah. the the downside is all there and the upside isn't that's very interesting that's, yeah that's depends depends on the uh, kind of the psychological and belief priors of the of the members of the group because you could have permanent chaos you know, it depends on how you were primed. Like, you know, many marriages are like that. You know, the fact that even in marriages, people <laughs> yeah. don't realize that, you know, the most effective thing you could do in the first year is to is to exactly establish what one likes, what one is good at, what, what, what fits one's, you know, maybe genetic inclinations uh, to do. Uh, and then just make sure that that's your domain, that's my domain. It's It's extremely easy. I see so many people not doing this and I see, you know, so many people even come to me and tell me, oh, you know, this is permanent conflict. Well, you've created the perfect scenario for permanent conflict. Just don't. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah I mean, just don't have permanent conflict. Yeah. It, it, it's like, you know what the solution to permanent conflict is? And, and it's, and it's, you know, and, and again, I, I, all these things trickle down, all these things trickle down from how the people at the top have to think about power because you only have one way most people don't have the ability to context shift so if you think about power that way most of the time then you think about that in your whole life and maybe you make an unprincipled exception and you live a little bit differently in some ways but for the most part when you have to fall back in your default of of what you think is not something that you consciously think but sort of a habit and you know aristotle says virtue is habit and everything is habit and then you fall back on 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 these habits that are that are that are the way our society has and the way and it's all trickled down from this ridiculous absurd like form of governance that we have where it's like we're not even technically governed by the government we're technically we're in in the United States we're governed by a massive entity that communicates on social media that has tentacles within businesses and academia and 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 university businesses and academia and government and and they all know and they all know each other by 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 smell and they identify each other and they can tell who the the good progressive is in a conflict and that person always gets sided with and it, and it trickles down to to everything and, and and it's chaos yeah and it's you know it's 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 very hard to um wiggle out of <laughs> yeah in the sense that um the the lifeblood that actually fuels the system and why it's such a great operating system for what's going on right now is you know the fact that you have extremely um consolidated uh, markets you you know immigration you know immigration is the main 
topic on our side. And it's hard even for people who are whatever centrist to write to whatever to even discuss seriously because it's what fuels everything. It's one of the big chunks that of, of, of the, the, the motor of what keeps things going in the, in the current paradigm. And people really don't want to upset the apple cart because it's, you know, in many ways it is good. Um, but yeah, it just it feels to me many times that, you know, this, the cathedral, the emergent thing that we're all talking about is just, you know, just the, the, the perfect philosophy to, to support and to, to legitimate the fact that this is how money is made now by buying cheap shit in China, moving it here, you know, fabricating all of your antibiotics in Shenzhen and stuff like that. This is just how things are done. And to make the thing, the way that how things are done continue working, we need to believe that, you know, we are all equal, hierarchy is evil, all of this type of stuff, because, you know, this is what keeps the, the wheels greased. And that is also why I think it's going to be extremely hard to, um, yeah, to uh, to to replace this uh, this operating system to to replace it, yeah. But you see, all right, I'm a little bit more optimistic about that than than that take is because I don't think that you need to replace. I don't think there's any reason why you can't have a, a you know like all right. So there's an old libertarian thing about there's an old libertarian tale about have you I don't know if you've ever read this about uh, uh about I think it's like I pencil. Yeah. Have you heard of this? Have you heard of this story? Yeah, Russ Roberts this? Yeah. love and the, the story. Idea, <laughs> yeah, and and the idea is, and and you know, I mean, like I I, I like to uh, I like to disagree with libertarians in a lot of ways, but that's my background as far as my you know my intellectual background. But they're right about a lot of things, and the idea is, no one knows how to make a pencil. No one person knows how to make a pencil. It's distributed information, and there's no reason why you can't have systems that work that way. Like. You don't have to know the guy who's shipping you, you know, the little metal, the little bent metal things that you put on the end of the pencils. You don't have to know the guy. Like you get a shipping container full of them. He doesn't need to know what they're for. Like it, there's no reason why you have to have the entire population of the third world move to your country to import. God, I don't even know what we import from the third world other than oil. Uh, <laughs> people. <laughs> yeah. You know, like. Horror is <laughs> beyond your comprehension. You know, we, we import, yeah, yeah, you know, that, that too. We do that. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think that there's I don't think that you have to I don't think that we have to be that pessimistic about that. Like I think you can be a lot more closed. And and China shows this, right? China wanted to China saw the the, the China, you know the the Communist Party of China saw the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and they were like, "Wow, we do not want that to happen to us." And they sort of closed off in a lot of ways and it, it gives a model of how you can do it. You don't have to be open to everything to the world to trade with the world. Right. But no. you know, I, I mean, you know, this is, this is the Nick land. This is the Nick land section of, of, of near reaction is that the machine is assembling itself in the sense that if everybody does the smallest possible task, uh, you're assembling a giant machine that does things and you, because you have this like micro level division of labor and because of micro division, micro level division of labor, you can do incredible things like chip manufacturing. I mean, can you imagine the complexity that it would take to have like, and, and you can, you can see it, the, the complexity in the labor reflects the complexity, the complexity, the division of labor complexity reflects directly the literal physical complexity of the chips you're able to produce. So in early days in Silicon Valley, when, when it got its name Silicon Valley, because it, you know, chips were produced there, there was less division of labor. These people had to be generalists about the whole thing. And so you were able to produce less sophisticated chips. But then as you were able to have more division of labor, you had Moore's law, which meant that you could double the amount of of complexity of your of the of your product every single year just by people learning what to do about it. This is this is this is definitely very far away from any of my notes. <laughs> no, no worries. I mean, it's um, it's you know very relevant. I mean, it, this whole uh, you know kind of I, I feel like uh, the 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 Nick Land corner of uh, of of our space is uh, is probably the more. I don't know. The more black filling for me, at least, <laughs> it feels a little you bit. You think so, really? I don't know. It depends what what type of future you imagine. I mean, I'm I'm a lady. I just want you know. I I don't necessarily want to be uh, absorbed into into the 
you know, w- whatever horrors techno capital is going to birth or <laughs> whatever one of the next generations. See, but, but, but now we can go, but we can actually, now, now we can circle back to something we were talking about earlier and how this relates to that is the only way out is through, right? In other words, if you yeah. can't avoid the techno, I mean, how can you avoid techno? You can how be can scared you avoid of it, which is what I'm, yeah. <laughs> this is the camp I'm in. I don't know if, you know, I mean, you could also cultivate some sort of optimism for it, but I, I don't think I can, I haven't brought myself to that point. I'm just like, um, I don't know. I'm just kind of looking over the, the edge of the, the cliff and I'm like, oh, this, this doesn't look very appealing and I don't really see any, any cool directions this could take. Here. Here's my case for the optimism for for techno capital optimism, okay? Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know how it'll whether it'll work out this way or not. The driving force in human social organization is, and I, I think I think even I think even Marxists agree with this. The driving force of human social organization is what it takes to build a military and what it takes to exercise military force. So in the Middle Ages, the most powerful military, the most powerful military force was an armored knight on horseback who was trained his entire life. And as a result, armored knights who could afford to keep horses and could train their entire lives were the centers of power. And those men and their friendships were the key to the centers of power. And we had a much better, we had a much better way of organizing society. And then Around the t- by the time of Napoleon, mass manufacturing was strong enough that you could mass manufacture weapons that a large army of of un- of relatively unskilled men could defeat any number of or, or or could defeat the an elite force, right? And then you have World War II, which takes that to the most extreme historically. And of course, World War II is the time of communism and democracy and you know, the the strange version of, you know, the sort of the bastardization of communism and democracy with excluding the communists that they had in, in, in Germany. And that is because it mot- you could motivate men, you could motivate many, many men to fight and you can manufacture things. And so the idea is techno techno commerce will maybe get to the point where you get closer militarily to the knight on horseback is able to defeat any number of peasants. You know, maybe maybe a man controlling drones can can beat any number of less intent. Maybe a, a 120 plus IQ man who knows how to control drones can defeat any number of armed people that that you know, the United States government can could 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 throw together out of their uh out of their bio Leninist client base. And that's a, that's maybe a reason for optimism. So that's yeah, it. That's my that's, case for optimism. I have to say that's something I have not considered. <laughs> the idea that I, I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, there there is essentially evolutionary pressure at play, um, and it is mm-hmm. not favoring whatever is going on in uh, in the U.S. government or the cathedral in general. Um, every 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 force that they're cultivating is entropy, um, and clusters of power are already forming. I mean, this whole, you know, Elon Musk thing, whatever you think about it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a scratch on the, on the record. And um, there have been multiple of these events and you can see there is um, alignment in, in certain groups of the elite with um, other types of ideas that are maybe more uh, eugenic. (laughs) So um, yeah, I mean, and it doesn't take long to, to see these things out. It takes a few generations. Um, so yeah, it might be, it, it might be, you know, um, what's that, um, backyard nukes might be the, the solution to, to all of our problems, <laughs> you know, generated by the, the many, many children of Elon Musk, <laughs> many of whom are probably not even recorded. So yeah, yeah. Modern day Genghis Khan and who, who, whatever other, I, I'm sure Elon Musk is not the, the only person who realizes these facts about reality. I mean, no. um, yeah. 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 Well, that's yeah. That's that's very interesting. Yeah. I yeah. I, I don't. I don't think he's the only one who realizes this, and I think that he's maybe the only one who's. You know, the thing is, it's is how conformist are our billionaires? Is the question. You know how how much do they 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 conform? It seems like a lot of them are quite conformist because they wanted. They sort of they were like people. They were men driven to succeed in the system in front of them, 
And once they succeeded, then they wanted to be accepted by the system that was in front of them. I mean, like like Bill Gates is like the the ideal example, right? I mean, he he had all the money and power that he he could have wanted to. Let me rephrase that. He didn't have any power. He had all the money he wanted. And what did he use his money for? He used his money to try to buy some measure of power through the route of getting the respect of progressives. And it really didn't work for him. Like, because yeah. if you're going to raise to that level, the money doesn't matter anyway. You know, if you can if you can get power, then money is like like a thing you reach your hand out and it gets filled with money if you need money. You know, like like does Hillary Clinton worry about money? No. If Hillary Clinton needs money, she goes and demands money from someone, you know, or, or you know, she she she, of course, does it in the in the, you know, the perfect oligarchical way of not saying she's demanding it. She goes and she I will offer to give a speech to your to your group, like in the perfect deniable where everything is deniable and nothing is actually in action. But, yeah. And that brings me to and I wanted to the your your uh, your your writer of the uh, the spectator that AU. And uh, there was something that was uh, that was relevant to this, but I wanted I have found another 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 quote from Ted Kaczynski's thing where I fundamentally disagree with Ted Kaczynski, but I really liked this quote and I wonder I wanted to read it. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, the leftist of the over socialized type tries to get off his psychological leash and assert his autonomy by rebelling, but usually he is not strong enough to rebel against the most basic values of society. Generally speaking, the goals of today's leftists are not in conflict with the accepted morality. On the contrary, the left takes an accepted moral principle, adopts it as his own, and then accuses mainstream society of violating that principle. And he lists some examples. All of these have deeply rooted values of our society, or at least its upper or middle. All of these have been deeply rooted values of our society, or at least its upper at least of its upper and middle classes for a long time. These values are explicitly or implicitly expressed or presupposed in most of the material presented to us by the mainstream communications media and the communication system and the educational system. Leftists, especially those of the over-socialized type, usually do not rebel against these principles, but justify their hostility to society by claiming, with some degree of truth, that society is not living up to these principles. Which is, which is, I think, a lot of what you see in 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 the rationalist adjacent spheres. You see a lot of like, like we're rebelling by living even more up to the principles of society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the 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 main issue that I see. I mean, I I wonder, I wonder what you think about you know the the, the recent implosion of effective altruism. Because I mean, you mentioned Sam Bankman Fried, oh. but. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a strange, I, I don't know. I don't see it coming back from this, to be honest. I mean, you know, it's interesting because it's, it's, <laughs> what do I, what do I, well, um, it kind of, a recent thing that opened my eyes is the, is the, so, the, so they have two main, they have two main things that they, that they do when they talk about. And, and one is malaria nets in Africa, because maximizing the because conforming better to the cathedral standards of what is right and wrong is maximizing the total human biomass that is made up of cathedral clients but cathedral preferred clients and malaria nets do that and the other thing that they do is ai safety and ai safety is actually something that i, I think is very interesting i've had an in-person conversation with a with a rationalist adjacent person and yeah I'm, I'm convinced that that's a that's a problem but i think it's downstream of progressivism and it's unsolvable as long as we have an oligarchic system because no one will look out for the system as a whole people in the people in the system want to create problems not solve them so you know that's a side note i think it's something that's solvable but only in a new framework but practically speaking, what do you think that their money goes towards? Their money goes towards haranguing AI researchers to put someone in to make sure chat GPT never cites FBI crime statistics. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, it might like the penny, the pennies rot, it, the scales fell away. And I was like, oh, that's what they're doing. That's what the AI safety money is going towards for now. You yeah. know, you know so, what's it's really interesting to, to interrupt you, but you know, I, I've no. I've kind of been adjacent to these uh, EA, you know, effective altruism circles for a while, and you know, I was telling you the story about the flat hierarchy company. Well, 
the exact dynamic happened in, you know, I've been in Facebook groups, all sorts of open groups where you have these, you know, just, you know, semi-autistic people opening uh, a little group to chat about effective altruism. And, you know, they, they bring up a few things, whatever, qualia, fish, whatever stuff that's interesting to them. Yeah. And then one oh, of them, God. you know, a, a Rocco <laughs> type will come up with something that's, um, you know, reflects some aspect of reality that most rationalists don't want to look at. Well, then, <laughs> then that's the interesting part. Yeah. 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 Well, these people get ostracized instantly. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the group descends into, into chaos because obviously people's priors are being attacked here because, you know, it's not effective altruism if you actually inject, you know, truth claims that are uncomfortable into it. And then that spawns different groups. You know, Rocco has to move into um, heterodox effective altruism. What do you think happens to heterodox <laughs> effective altruism within six months same to a exact year? Exact thing. Exact same thing. You know, there's a, another little barrier is hit, you know, and then these groups just tend to auto consume themselves. And, um, and they also escalate like in the first group, because the people who had maybe a little bit of a, um, a little heterodox streak to them uh, are completely silenced. They wouldn't want to, you know, get out of. And so, so the the group essentially collapses into an echo chamber, um, and the only people who can speak are the people who are very much aligned or will push the envelope in the other direction. You know, they're they're more and more obsessed with I don't know whatever malaria nets and uh, no, maybe not malaria, but whatever uh, transgender equity and, and stuff that's you know very important to them. Yeah. Well, this is all right. So there's a there's an example I, I read of this. I, I um, so Kelsey Kelsey Turok, I believe is is her name. She writes for she writes for Vox. Uh, she she had a she had a blog called The Unit of Caring, and she's she's one of the big ones in the in the rationalist community. You know, like considered one of the one of the, one of the one of the higher ups. Um, she goes and, and and somebody somebody tracks down a thing where she writes about how she would cry herself to sleep over the kids in cages during the Trump administration, right? When she didn't write about during she didn't write during the Trump administration, but she wrote that she did that during the Trump administration. And then the guy's like, look, I waited six months after this, and now the Trump administration is over. I waited, I waited, I waited. I've seen nothing from you in Fox or anywhere like this about kids in cages again. And <laughs> And he's like, I consider this that that I consider this proof positive that you're purely doing this as a manipulative tact, a manipulative tactic. And then she actually she goes and like somebody brings this up on 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 Twitter, and then and then she goes into a forum, a, a rationalist, a quaka forum, and she so expertly leads them away from the point that she basically was like is is like sort of turned herself into a utility monster uh, in their terms and is willing to manipulate her emotional state for for the gain of the progressive machine and she so expertly leads them away and into this discussion of theoretical oh well I kind of feel about this about open borders but not this and da, 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 da. and like it's just this thing and then the conversation dies out and it's like the fact that they had her dead to rights at the beginning and then she just oop and she just spins them away from it it was amazing to me to watch that to watch that happen like I have a link to that forum if you're if you're curious. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I'd love to 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 have a look at it and put it in the notes. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's something about word cells and the and rationalism. You know, there's and and there's also something about being highly verbal and being able to spin stories for yourself. You know, it's and and obviously rationalism is is great is a great um, skin suit to wear for that. You know, because you declare yourself oh, yeah. rational. You you're obviously you know being a rationalist. Things are rational. You you know you're probably more rational than other people. You're you're going into that direction. And even if you know you're you're less wrong than other people, even if you don't say that you're completely rational. You know, there's there's that. Uh, but essentially, you're just spinning your wheels with words, and then you can make yourself believe anything and um you know and and convenient things are easier to believe and things that are aligned with status are so much easier to believe so yeah oh so much easier to believe but it also but it comes back to the flaw of the marketplace of ideas is if you can pretend to not be convinced and you can sort of if you can pretend to not be convinced by anything but the high status ideas well that's controversial we can't because one of the things that they talked about and and, and one of the first place one of the first communities i got kicked out of on the internet was was the uh the comment section on the uh, slate star codex 
And and he, he actually had to resort to kicking me out of the comment section for, and, and I quote, for no reason at all, because I, I wouldn't viol- I didn't violate any of the rules of, of truth or necessary or kind. But, you know, like, like I just kept breaking up these things. And, it, you know, you can, you can say uncomfortable things, but if they don't like them, if they don't, they want, they want to conform. And that's the Ted Kaczynski quote. They want to be conformist to society's virtues. And if you look at a lot of things rationally, you realize that society's virtues are fucked. <laughs> like the virtue that, that they seem to want to, to, to want to conform to and and they never say it is is the uh, is the, is this quote that I have from from Twitter where this woman said once normalize women doing whatever the hell they want seems to be their primary sexual ethos. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, they women, construct like they, they, they could, yeah. I mean, just saying yeah. women but it's, specifically. It's, but yeah. 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 Normalize women doing whatever the hell they want. Like 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 it's. <laughs> Yeah, so that's you know, so they they result in I think that's the cause of their uh, their embrace of polyamory. Yeah, I mean, it it also seems to you know excuse excuse me if I have many rational followers, but it uh there is um a certain it attracts a certain phenotype, you know. It's it does you know it 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 gives a little bit of a bio Leninist vibe sometimes, you know. It does feel like okay, we believe the set of values because it's. It is a bit convenient, you know, like a polycule seems to be a fairly predictable, a fairly um, like phenotypically predictable combination. You know, there's just a few ways this plays out and you either have a harem or you have, you know, a, a semi attractive queen bee, at, you know, surrounded by yeah, like the queen bee. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Surrounded by not non-attractive, very beta type. Well, she gets, she she gets she gets a I'll say it, it's it's you require a little more disagreeableness to say it so I'll say this she Thanks. she gets to the simulacrum of of being an attractive woman in that men fight for her attention and the men get to touch a woman so that's sort of like what everybody gets out of it yeah, and <laughs> on top of it and on top of it uh, win, win. <laughs> on top of it, they get to more closely follow the society's maxim that they realize and other people don't that the moral rule is normalize women doing whatever the hell they want. Like they don't re- like no one consciously admits that this is the rule, but they sort of follow they sort of follow that and they want to conform even more to that rule than other people, which is which is my my Ted Kaczynski quote. <laughs> <laughs> and how it relates to this, yeah, and it's... they're over, they're the over socialized. But I, look, I, I I just want to say though, just just to soften this a little bit, I do like a lot of them, and you know, like like Rocco is is fantastic. Like like I like I like a good number of them, and I can get along with them, and I feel like it's sort of like a natural fit. But it's like, come on, guys, you gotta like lift or something. You gotta you gotta have some balls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in addition to being rational, a lot of the people on more directly on our side are either ex-rationalists or are rationalists who just, you know, were one one degree more autistic and and could just, you know, put up with the fact that you know there might be social consequences to um, trying to look at the whole data set and you know update your priors yeah. to to the actuality of of, of what's going on. Um, yeah, but there, there are some, some good, I mean, the, the guy you, you mentioned, uh, Yash, Yash Kaff, I think, I don't know, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's, Yashi. he's a good one. I mean, he's, he's, you know, polyamorous. Right, there I'm are gonna, many things that I, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, I'm yeah, clicking the follow great. button on him right um, now if you vouch for him. So, done. yeah, I mean, you, me now, now we are now mutuals. You might, uh, you might, you know, cringe at some, some of the takes, but he's, he's very, um, you know, to, to give everyone an ex- extensive review of this person that, you know, has been on podcast. But, you know, if you want to follow a rationalist, he's a, he's a good person to follow. He's very honest. Uh, he's very open. He's also very open to criticism. He, he's aware of the arguments on our side. He doesn't buy them. I think his personal life situation is a, a you know, I think this lifestyle probably fits him um, in a way. And then he, you know, maybe rationalizes it a little bit, but also, you know, uh, yeah, man... <laughs> Uh, has a, has a interesting views and he lays them out very fairly. Um, and I think his description of the podcast is good. I think it's it's true. And yeah, I'll probably do more okay, and more episodes good. that have the same the same conclusion. 
Um, oh, by the way, I just want to say, yeah. like, I, I just followed your pronunciation of, 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 you, you call them, Ro, uh, you call them Rocco, but I, I always called them Rocco. I always assumed it was Rocco. Oh, so, but I never spoken with them voice wise. I think it's Rocco. Yeah. I called him yeah. Rocco, so he didn't correct me. So, yeah. Okay. There you go. All right. All right. So then I will, cha- I will update my, I will update my thing. I will update my pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. Up to update your, your right. prize on that. Um, yeah, no. Uh, now, whenever I talk about the basilisk, I have to give it a different name. <laughs> it's Rocco's yeah. basilisk, not Rocco's basilisk. I don't know. I don't know. Now you've confused me, but I think I've, I've, I've talked to, if did I say, I think I have, I've, I've pronounced his name on the podcast definitely. And he didn't correct me. And I feel like he's disagreeable okay. enough to have corrected me. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think it's, it's Rocco. Yeah. yeah. He would have told me. So yeah, <laughs> okay. um, it's completely off off the off the map here. But um, yeah, I also just wanted to get like a few notes here. The but, listeners, yeah. the listeners like per, the listeners like personal stuff too. Yeah, I think I think they do. Um, yeah, not 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 too <laughs> not too much. <laughs> not not too personal. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 thinking about maybe in the next year having a more like uh, you know personal t- not not necessarily like the, you know showing people like you know, what I cook and stuff, but just having more of a chat type show. Uh, Cause I feel like this is very much kind of an interview show. I want to really showcase the how greatest hits of every poster I have on. And I feel like, you know, just talking about completely random stuff is not great for the individual that's coming on. So I try to, you know, make it about their, their ideas. Um, but yeah, it might be occasionally having a, a talking shit show is, is quite nice. Like I, I, I have a lot of fun. Like I mean, I, I chat to to Geo, and it's really fun because we're a bit more. I, mean, I wouldn't say we're close, but we've talked multiple times, and it's much easier. I, I don't feel like you know, even to you, I feel much more relaxed than I do. Like I don't know if I t- speak to someone who's like I don't know, like it's a sailor. I was a little bit like, oh, I hope I'm not going to sound like a retard talking to sailor. Yeah, he's he's well, it's yeah. I mean, you know, look, I mean, you know, sailor is is is. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm older than you, but Sailor was still sort of like like I read Steve Sailor as sort of one of the roads to my red pilling, you know. So that's like you know he's he's uh, he's you know he's 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 like the the, the master splinter. You ever see like the meme of Master Splinter with the little turtle with the teenage me- yeah. Ninja Turtles <laughs> as, as little as little babies, and it's labeled with Sailor, and then he walks, and then in the next one, like you know, the turtles are all grown up, and like you know, Sailor's the you know the 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 master splinter is like the old man, but like, you know, we all have like affection for him and, you know, he's not, he's not, he's not gone or anything, but yeah, that's how we feel. That's how a lot of us feel about him. Yeah. And it it is a bit strange because I do have like people from all across the, the, the spectrum, you know, like more smaller anons and, you know, people who are big to me. Like, you know, I told, I told my husband, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interview Curtis Yarvin and he was like, good for you. <laughs> I have no idea who Curtis Yarvin <laughs> is. I told him it's a really big deal. And he was like, that's, that's great. Good, nice, nice. You well, go. You're, you're, I, I just want to say you're, you're, you're very special. Actually, managing to snag a Curtis Yarvin interview. So he did. He did do a lot of interviews. No, everyone I'm, at one point. I'm, yes, that's. Yes, that well, is yeah. The joke. Sorry, sorry. The, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I get it no, now. No, but, no, you know, my not, husband not, didn't not know diminish, about this. To, yeah, no, not to diminish. Not to. I mean, he's tremendously significant and a great guest on all these things. But like, like. I, I think he's on a thousand podcasts at this point. Yeah, yeah, at this point. But at but that point, he did, got, did just did a hundred. So you know, I was extra. Oh, there special. you go. But yours, got, but yours got written up in Vanity Fair. Though, so that's much more. Important. I think so because uh, I'm a lady, and uh, it it opens You're certain doors. <laughs> yeah, no, it just I, I feel like it's you know it's an it's an extra layer to it just because like you know people are confused like what. <laughs> What's this woman talking about? With the there's a woman and there's Curtis Yarvin. What's going on here? So um, you know, it it, it just it's it's clickbaity. It, it makes people confused, and that adds to to the popularity of the show. Um, you know, which is one of my many angles that I'm that I'm working here. Um, yeah, there's one other thing I want to ask you, um, and this is an this is an interesting thing because actually I talked to. Um, the guy that the, the episode just came out today with, with Michael Bailey, and he's kind of a, one of the the greats of transgender research, um, and you know, oh. this so-called heterodox research. He's one of the people you know, who coined, um, you know, the 
um, auto, autogynophilia, auto-gynophilia and, you know, all the, you know, the, the typology of transgenderism and, you know, essentially that it's a sexual fetish and not much, much else in many cases. Anyway, um, and we are also like the second part of the interview is about pedophilia and kind of the rights um, relationship to pedophilia and, you know, what it means and, and how people interpret it. And I am, you know, I'm obviously conflicted, you know, pedophilia is probably know top five greatest nightmares you know just like cosmic horror yeah, uh, of grips me when i think of that pedophilia yeah, the, wor- the worst of the, the worst of the worst yeah exactly but i also but, at the same know, time it's, it's yeah because yeah, I, I, I know what you're going to ask me about because it's it's sort of like the thing is 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 the left will like the 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 trad cons think the word is a weapon that they can use against the left and the left is happy to let them use the word as a weapon but the reality is that the left knows that they're going to win that conflict because they're just going to redefine the word and they're going to redefine the word and women are going to go along with it because they're going to define the word as the woman is one second older one woman is younger than the man by le- by more than three seconds and that's the only definition that they will admit in public and then the other definition is not pedophilia that's just look gay people need to be free and learn and explore and and you're protecting their rights as children blah 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 like you know gay gay people need special guidance in our extremely homophobic society and older members of the community can provide that will be the definition that the left will will pounce on and will define out that part of it which is what most people want to say the essence of it is but they will lose that battle until they control until they control you know means of communication yeah I, so I also, that's, that's my only take and i don't want to talk about the, the object level on that too much yeah it's it's, it's a weird one because it, it really it, it sends a lot of people on our side into you know kind of like these thought terminating cliches and um you know obviously i'm you know i'm not um promoting pedophilia in any way but it really no. is you know I, I do feel like the age of consent has has gotten a, a very like mythical shine to it because um when you have a culture based on consent there is you know you have to have one anchor and it's the only anchor left and i feel like for even for 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 the left and the right it's still you know it's 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 a very it's it is a mythical concept and it's very hard to um to talk about it, you know, in in a in a serious well, way with that. Yes, it, it's very, it is very, it is very hard to talk. All right, so let's let's all right, let's break it down this way. Is is there are sort of there are sort of three sides. There are sort of three sides to this, right? It's it's one is the well more, but let's just say there's three sides to talking about the age of consent, which I hate to do, but there are three, and one is one is very bitter women who who don't like the fact that men like women who are younger than them and and there's hysteria about this where zoomers are considered zoomers think that a 26 year old man with a 22 year old woman is a pedophile they will call they will use that word on him like that's that's and zoomers have absorbed more than anyone else the output of the machine and and sort of like internalized it they conform better to the values of the society that they've been pushed to and that's the value of the society and that's one and two is the libertarian view of age of consent isn't rational it's not right blah 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 and then in parentheses because i want to bang teenage girls and that is also wrong and then the third take which sounds like the second one which gets conflated with the second one is age of consent is not important her father's consent is what's important and that's what happened in traditional society the idea is you can't have a sexual free-for-all and the problem with a sexual free-for-all is not that the guy the 16 year old girl is banging is 24. the problem is that the 16 year old girl is sexually uncontrolled and society can't exist when women are sexually uncontrolled because it ruins marriages it ruins it ruins everything and everything breaks down the way you've seen it break down today and so that's sort of the line and it's very hard to talk about because they always lump if you say if you're in the third category they just attack you by saying you're in the second category yeah, no, and it's this usually is a... the people who are 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just saying that that's that's a that's a good way of of, of laying it out because there, I mean, in a system where you have that that problem of constraint, you know, you have unconstrained women. Um, unconstrained, you know, the, the whole of society is unconstrained, but the women have a, a certain, um, a certain other level of being unconstrained in the sense yeah. that you, not everyone has the same constraints. So obviously, the women have uh, yeah. fewer. So um, the, yeah. the 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 problem. Well, it's, it's a, yeah. I like I like to put it this way: is is the system has the system on a level knows that men and women are different. And so it launches different attacks at men and women to get them to be more like the bio-Leninist biomass. And so the attack on women is give them freedom and they will become feral and they're better clients if they're feral. And then the attack on men is different. It's not remove restraints on them because if you remove restraints on men, then they react in a very different way than if you remove the restraints on women and it doesn't make them to better bio-Leninist clients. So, it has different attacks on them. So it's not, it's not the same. So you can't talk about children in quotes because boys get very different treatment than girls by the system because the system is trying to do the most harm to both of them. Yeah. What, what do you think of the kind of the MRA claim that, you know, uh, rape is just as common um, male, you know, female to male as, as male to female. Oh God, and- it's ridiculous. <laughs> I know, but it's just like uh, I, mean, I, I. It comes up. If, if you're an M, if you're an MRA, like I like to say this, it's like it's like if you're an MRA, um, you're not sexist enough, is like what I like to say. And I just I like to say this, like if you're worried about a black versus white race war, you're not racist enough. Like the <laughs> the fact of the matter is, yeah, because I, because, I get because it. you know. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, like, and it's like the idea is like, no, men and women aren't equal. You don't need to have men's rights. You need to have certain solid rules that are set down in antiquity that that work that allow that allow cooperate cooperate equilibria instead of defect defect equilibria. And men having the same rights as women to do whatever the hell they want is not how you get there. It's how you get worse because it's it's. <laughs> because again, it goes back it's to Ted Kaczynski. Degrading quote. in a way. I mean, it's just it's not it's not the yeah. you know the, the fact. I mean, obviously, no, it's not appropriate for men. Yeah, yeah, it is. It really isn't. <laughs> but it, but, it's but it goes. But but it goes back to the but it goes back to the Ted Kaczynski quote. They're rebels who are rebelling because society is not living up to the stated values that society has, and they get no traction because. They're right on one level in the fact that it's not really equality, but they're wrong on the level that society doesn't really value equality because the machine knows that men and women are different, even if the machine doesn't say it. And so so it's like it's like there are three levels. There's like the surface level of the normie, and then there's the MRA is one level above that and realizing that the machine isn't isn't getting equality right. And then there's one level above that, which is the machine knows that men and women are the same, so it's doing different things to them. So you have to, you have to, you have to transcend the MRA, the MRA ness. Be more sexist, please. Be at least as sexist as the machine is. I mean, and by that, um, our, our esteemed guest means confront yourself with the bare facts of nature, and uh, and uh, yeah, become become enlightened. That is, that is actually exactly what I mean. Yes. That is exactly what I mean. I don't mean I don't mean beat up your wife for burning the roast. <laughs> exactly. I mean that's we would not endorse that. Uh, though I have gotten a, like a, a minor scolding recently because I loaded dishwasher wrong, which I accept because I did load dishwasher wrong because the dishwasher is a, is a foreign country to me. <laughs> But that's you. Do you know that I don't know if you've been following this, but women loading dishwashers has been actually part of the discourse on Twitter. Yeah, I've right I've now. actually <laughs> written <laughs> written a comment about this because it was just so funny because I just saw that dishwasher discourse just like minutes after I received my instructional tutorial about how to <laughs> <laughs> about you know you know like including things like how do you think the water will reach this? And I was like, I don't even know where the water comes from. I think this whole thing just immerses I don't know. It's itself magic. in. Yeah, it's like it's a black box. Literally, it is a black box in my kitchen. I just put the stuff in there and sometimes the gauze of the dishwasher, you know, show me an <laughs> upended cup and like a crusty thing and tell me, you know, 
try again next time. You know, maybe you'll be lucky. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just, I just don't, I just don't worry about that. <laughs> it's just, I don't mind. <laughs> okay. But you know what? But I like the way you phrase that. And let's, let's, let's actually, let's, let's extrapolate from that a little bit. You said the <laughs> gods of the dishwasher, right? What is the difference between a ritual to please the gods of the dishwasher and, and using the rational principles of loading the dishwasher correctly? Like, it's just that it means that not everyone has to figure out that and you can transmit, look, this displeases the gods of the dishwasher. And it's literally true. It does displease the gods of the dishwasher if you can't reach the grannies in the, in the corners. <laughs> Indeed, there's yeah. Like the, there's that's, like theism. That's the case yeah, for, like yeah. Theism. theism, trad values, all this type of stuff, you know. Don't yes. don't worry about it. Just do it. Yeah, I'm, I agree. I yeah. like it, you know. I even I yeah. wrote a piece, re- I mean, not recently, like two years ago about exactly this, you know, about that's the reason. fact that this is all just, you know, baked in heuristics and heuristics that are so profound that... You can't even, you know, if you if you're sitting on your ass all day trying to deduce them from from first principles, you're not going to make it. So you better just take yeah. the heuristics and be trad rationalist, you know. So anyway, yeah. that's that was <laughs> that was the conclusion there. Um, I know we are coming up on time. And I'll have to go to bed soon, but I want to ask you a question of the show again. Um, do we have a subversive thinker that you would like to recommend to the audience? Sure. And last time I recommended, last time I recommended uh, an author. So this time I decided I'm going to recommend um, movie directors and writers and and their own law of work. Um, I want to recommend the Coen brothers. And I think there's, there is something very interesting and, and, and this wasn't one of the movies I wanted to recommend, but, but I think this brings up an, a very interesting point is, is the movie Fargo. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Yeah. Right? I love the Coen brothers. But in the movie Fargo, I love the Coen brothers and, and in the movie Fargo, and, and this is sort of this this comes up with uh with our sphere um a guy gets into financial into financial trouble and his father-in-law is very well off um but his father-in-law is 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 does not want to give him money so he hatches a plot to have a quote-unquote fake kidnapping of his wife where he can have the father-in-law come up with the ransom. He does the ransom drop. He takes most of it. He pays off the kidnappers a small fee, and then they let her go, right? And the idea is it's a fake kidnapping. But the reality is, and the, the whole plot spirals out of control, it's very interesting, but the reality is the the lesson you can learn from this is there's no such thing as a fake kidnapping. Just like you can't ironically worship satan you can't ironically summon a demon because the forces involved make it real because it becomes real because of the game theory involved once this person's kidnapped everyone involved is a kidnapper and everyone involved has to act like a kidnapper because that is because kidnappers act that way because of game theory and and because they become the thing and it's no different than saying you become the thing they have called. He has called up something he cannot put down, and that's that's sort of what I take out of out of out of Fargo as being one of one of our things. And that wasn't one of the movies I wanted to recommend, but I wanted to recommend Burn After Reading, and I wanted to recommend Hail Caesar. And I think those are two two of their lesser viewed movies. But Burn After Reading is like this uh, this comedy set in D.C. Um, with the intelligence community and around in and around D.C. operatives and the intelligence community and just how rudderless and dim they are and, and and just like not understanding it and how things spiral out of control from things they don't understand. And none of the characters at any point in the movie understand the whole plot, which is something that you never see in a movie. But you see that in reality all the time, and it and it shows why the rules exist and why the ethical constraints exist, because no one sees the whole plot. And the idea of seeing the whole plot in fiction is is a fiction itself that gives you a wrong idea of how rational and good you can be about making decisions. Well, I wouldn't have done that. Well, he didn't know that. This guy didn't know that. None of these people knew what was going on in the entire movie, and it worked out horribly because they're terrible people. You know, but none of them could know that. And then the last one I want to talk about is 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 Hail Caesar. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's fantastic. Seen this one. Tremendous, yeah. tremendous comedy. Oh, it's great comedy. And there's, you know, like musical numbers. It's tremendously funny. And there's a lot of subplots to it. 
Um, but the vas- the basic thing is Josh Brolin is a stu- Josh Brolin's character is a studio fixer and he takes care of problems and he kind of runs the studio and he's like a very important figure in the studio. But he's you know a a go getter in Los Angeles and a high placed executive in Los Angeles and. So he is being courted by Lockheed Martin, because I don't know if you know how much about the geography of the U.S., but like the other in major industry in California, in Southern California was the defense industry with, with film during the Cold War. And he was being courted by Lockheed Martin. And it's sort of an implicit choice. And then there's a plot with communist screenwriters, which is just amazing to see that on screen where, you know, the communists of Hollywood hate it when you point out that there's a bunch of communist screenwriters there. And, and there's a whole bunch of subplots, but the the point of the choice is 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 how does the skilled, intelligent man best defend his way of life, making weapons or helping to tell stories? And in the end of the movie, he makes a decision on one of those two things. And you know, I mean, you can guess which decision he makes by the fact that it's being made. The movie is made by the Coen brothers, who chose to dedicate their lives to telling stories and and enforcing that, but. It goes to the same thing that we're talking about, where the most powerful weapon is coordination and the most powerful weapon is storytelling. And the most powerful weapon is understanding the truth on your understanding the truth and and aligning your side with the truth and having your side be cohesive. So there you go. There's there's my there's my subversive thinker recommendation. That's mm, extraordinary. That's that's excellent. Yeah, it makes me want to just go go watch it. I mean, it's probably much better than Netflix slop I was going to watch. So, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. um, oh, oh, wait. And there's there's a there's a side note for a friend of the podcast too. Is their famous movie their fr- their famous movie The Big Lebowski? I don't know if you know this about this movie. Famous movie The Big Lebowski. John Millions. The John Goodman character. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Based on a based on someone you've interviewed on the podcast. Yeah. Or based on the uh, the based on the daughter of some uh, the the father of someone you've interviewed on the podcast. Anyway, so yeah, that was, it's that was it's incredible. That's another anecdote I told my husband. I was like, I. I interviewed the daughter of the guy from the Big Lip. You know that guy? And he was like, wow, <laughs> cool. <laughs> so he's still, you know, I'm trying to make this stuff relatable. Like, you know, so this, this is big yeah. stuff. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you so much. This this has been excellent as always. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I I really want to do this again. And um, I also want to point people towards your sub stack. I, you know, you mentioned there is a sub stack. Oh, yeah, it's... it's- there is a Substack as of now. I have no essays, but um, I have I have a uh, I actually have an outline for twenty seven of them that would that would be book length if I actually wrote them all. Of my idea on the Substack and is just to have it be sort of like the explainer of of near reaction and and, mm-hmm. and sort of like what we've come to think about all these things because I wanted to be more of an eternal thing than than a commentary on on this particular event and I'll use events to illuminate but that's it yeah um, I coffee anon mm-hmm. at subst- uh, dot substack dot com perfect yeah I'll I'll put it in the show notes and and that's kind of what I I you know just to conclude all this I think that your value as a poster is you know, like people like, you know, R and McIntyre are very good to, you know, explaining in RX like basic stuff and, you know, illustrating it with, with current examples and stuff like that. But I feel like you're probably the most um, cogent refiner of NRX principles. I mean, you take it to, to different places. I think you've built on the foundation of NRX more than I think anyone else. And I think that's awesome. And I also think that Substack is going to be great, and also you know, no shade on Aaron. He's doing you know God's work, and he's he, you know his Substack is no, great no as well. Uh, but yeah, there's you know you've been extremely creative, and you've you've taken it into uh, a lot of very very cool directions, and uh, that's why I stand. So yeah, thank you so much for for coming back on. Thank you, Alex. This is great. <laughs>